ready. Okay, well, thank you for joining us for tonight's performance of The Wolves Are Coming For You. And thanks especially to Yarn School for organising everything so that we can be here with you now. My name is Erin and this is Pia. Yes, hello. The scenes of our play take place in and around the village. Various locations, various characters, so no traditional sets. Which means we need you. We need you to fill in the gaps far more than a nice bit of painted background might. We need you to entirely transform this room to make this floor into the cold stones of a church or the mulch of an old forest. We need you to recreate this ceiling and make for us the low beams of a village pub or explode into a canopy of stars. This is me inviting, summoning, conjuring you to help us. We do also have some lights and sound operate by Luke in the back there. So, the first scene is set just before dawn. The stars are fading as the sky brightens, mist puddling into the shallow of the valley. The sun hasn't broken the brow of the head over there, but it's coming. It looks how it must have looked when all of this was truly, properly wild, doesn't it? Basically, Alf, up here on the hill, Lewis Farm. Almost always been there, always with a Lewis working it. It's even in the Doomsday Book with the same name, but now. B. Lewis runs it alone. She's in her 70s. Her only daughter, Anna, no interest in farming at all. She's driving here from that direction. The city, power ballads on the radio, practicing the things she wants to say to her mum. Things like, I thought we could have some breakfast together. Got some parma ham, sourdough. And things like, well, you must have noticed it yourself. No, whether you've noticed it or not, Mum, we need to talk about it. That's Anna Lewis. Downhill from Lewis Farm is a church. The churchyard, the rectory, where the vicar lives. His name is Christopher. He's in bed. He's talking to himself in his sleep. I say talking. More accurately, he's making a reassuring sound. A sound like this. <laughs> Repeatedly. His wife, Dee, teaches in this village in our school. So, as usual, Dee is downstairs with piles of marking. Not sleep. Graveyard spreads downhill, backs into the school playing field. Small school, they're trying to close it. A handful of houses over there, the street it's called. Then there's a pub, obviously always a pub. Then a few even older cottages. The new estate was built just over there, not many houses. And a small wood between them and the village proper. Stream here, bridge green, and village hall. No one knows this, but the hall at the heart of the village is built on the remains of an ancient church. And that was built on a church that might have been Norse, which was built on a Roman church, which was built on a pagan church, which was built where the fires used to be. Fires around which people gathered for food, for warmth, to dance perhaps, to discuss threats, peace, the future, the past, stories. No one knows that this has always been a place for stories. No one knows any of this. So, beyond the village hall, one road heads for the bypass. That way, that's a new road, built about 50 years ago. And the other heads off to another village. Similar, but worlds apart. The people who live here, they're people like me. Maybe a bit like you. People with responsibilities. Parents, pets, children, 
memories of first kisses and deep losses. Health problems, hopes, fears, good people. Some of them might be taller than I am. Shorter. Thinner. Fatter. Older. Younger. Darker. Lighter. They might have accents different to our own. The vicar, for example, Christopher. He's middle-aged. He rarely exercises, so he looks um, comfortable. <laughs> He's got bags under his eyes in spite of sleeping well. The local policeman, Harry. Now, Harry tends to stand a little bit like this. change a school playground into a war zone. Her mother, Grace. Grace tends to say that her daughter is a bit fragile, under lots of pressure. The best thing I can do is make sure she's happy at home. Grace makes cakes for Ellen. Every day. And Ellen eats them. Every day. Because Grace measures her relationship in food. Which is something that D is concerned about. D is the vicar's wife. <laughs> yes, she's Christopher's wife and she's Ellen's teacher. So, at the most recent parents' evening, D tried to discuss Ellen's weight with Grace, but her attempt went something like, Grace, your daughter is a wonderful learner and She's absorbing so much from you. <laughs> Strong beliefs, you know, school counsel. But, well, she doesn't like sports or engage in the, um, well, she, she hates the changing rooms and, well, about the cakes. Could I possibly get a copy of some of the recipes? <laughs> Something touch her hand. 
She woke from a dream about being knee deep in mud, slipping, sliding down into a mucky, dark hole, looking down, nothing to grip. In her dream, she felt someone above her grasp her hand as someone she knew to be her late husband, wanting to help. And that's when she woke up. And now she's making herself a cup of tea. That same hand still shaking, trembling like this. And she hears someone outside. Pulling into the yard, Anna sees her mother stood in the headlights. And wants to say something as she steps out the car. But her mum beats her to it. Wolf! Sorry? <laughs>